Hey guys, it's Laura Slade, and today we're going to talk about how the endocrine system is involved in our response to stress. So let me describe a stressful situation for you. It's actually something that happened to me just this morning. You're enjoying a nice breakfast in the comfort of your home where it's nice and warm when you look at your watch and what do you know, your bus is coming in two minutes. I don't know about you, but my bus stop is three blocks away. As far as your physiological response is concerned, there are two options, fight or flight. Now, I could have thrown a hissy fit and knocked over my bowl of cereal, uh, but that wouldn't have been very productive. So instead, I opted for flight. I grabbed my bags and I ran for the bus. Now, we've already talked about how the nervous system, in part, is responsible for controlling our response to stress. In other words, our fight or flight response. But the endocrine system is actually involved as well. And in particular, there is one endocrine gland that also controls our response to stress, and that is the adrenal gland. Now, the adrenal gland is separated into two sections called the adrenal medulla and the adrenal cortex. And we're going to talk about how these two sections of that one organ are a little bit different in just a moment. So what we're going to talk about in today's video is what is the function of the adrenal glands, and then we'll mention how the endocrine response to stress is a little bit different from the response of the nervous system. So these are your endocrine glands right here, the kind of pinky fuchsia structures that sitting on top of the purple bean, and that purple bean is of course your kidneys. So in Latin, anything that has to do with the kidneys we refer to as renal. And the adrenal glands, well, they sit right on top of the kidneys. In fact, they kind of look like a little mohawk on top of that bean. So adrenal comes from their location. They sit directly on top of the kidneys. And as previously mentioned, the adrenal glands are going to help us in our fight or flight response. So what they're going to do is they're going to help increase our heart rate increase our blood pressure, and increase our rate of respiration. And altogether, these functions are going to increase the amount of energy and increase the amount of oxygen that's available to our muscle cells for cellular respiration. But the body has a limited amount of resources, so there's only so much energy to go around. At the same time, the adrenal glands are going to actually decrease digestion and decrease the energy spent in the other parts of our body that more are more for rest and repair. Those functions are going to be suspended until the stress response is over. And finally, the adrenal glands are going to stimulate the liver. They're going to stimulate the liver to release glucose. Now the liver is responsible for a very important function here. It's going to regulate how much of the energy we have available to us is actually circulating in the bloodstream as glucose versus how much of that energy is stored and tucked away for later. And the way that our liver stores glucose is it builds it into larger molecules called glycogen, which can be tucked away and used at a later time. Now to the untrained eye, the adrenal glands might not look like much, but if you know what you're looking for, it turns out they actually have a bit of a complex structure. And that's this idea that they're broken up into two sections. We mentioned that the first division of the adrenal gland was called the adrenal cortex. The cortex is located on the outsides of the adrenal gland, which we're looking at here in cross-section. On the other hand, the inside of the adrenal gland is called the adrenal medulla. And these two sections of the adrenal glands actually release different hormones. And because they produce different hormones, they can almost be considered to be different endocrine glands. Now, the adrenal cortex is going to produce hormones that are involved in a long-term response to stress. So here we're talking hours or even days. Whereas the adrenal medulla is responsible for a more immediate response to stress. So minutes to hours. Now, of course, immediate here is relative because we mentioned that the nervous system also is responsible for a stress response and the nervous system operates in the span of milliseconds. So that's a much faster response than we could ever see from the endocrine system. But the adrenal medulla is 
relatively a faster response than that from the adrenal cortex. Now, how do you remember these names? Cortex, medulla, long-term, immediate. Well, I have a bit of a memory trick for you. I always remember the M in medulla, middle, and immediate. So the, the adrenal medulla is in the middle of the adrenal gland and it's responsible for an immediate stress response. Not perfect, unfortunately, but if it works, you can use it. So let's take a closer look at what it is that the adrenal medulla is doing for this immediate response to stress. Well, the hormones that it produces include epinephrine and norepinephrine. And these two hormones work together to raise blood glucose, again by stimulating the liver to release glu glucose from its glycogen stores. And they also work together to cause something called vasodilation. Now, vasodilation means that your blood vessels are getting bigger, and bigger blood vessels can carry more blood. So this is going to occur around the lungs and in the blood vessels that are bringing oxygen and sugar to our muscles. So again, it's going to increase the availability of energy and oxygen to the cells that are going to need it the most. The release of epinephrine and norepinephrine from the adrenal medulla is actually triggered by a nerve impulse. This nerve impulse comes directly from the hypothalamus. So in some ways, the adrenal medulla is an effector organ. It is triggered by the nervous system. Now these words, epinephrine and norepinephrine, they might look familiar, and they should, that's because norepinephrine is also a neurotransmitter, one of the molecules that is capable of carrying a nerve impulse across an, uh, the synapse of a neuron. So, so it turns out that these molecules are multitaskers. They're doing more than one job at once. And that's okay, especially since norepinephrine as a neurotransmitter helps the sympathetic nervous system, which also responds to stress. So we can take a look at the pathway that the endocrine system is going to follow in terms of producing epinephrine and norepinephrine. So first of all, stress is actually perceived by the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus stimulates the adrenal medulla. Because of that stimulation, the adrenal medulla produces epinephrine and norepinephrine. And these two hormones together raise blood glucose and dilate blood vessels and increase the rate of respiration. Now there's another reason that epinephrine might sound familiar and that's because it's actually a commonly prescribed medication. It is the epi in EpiPen. It stands for epinephrine. Now EpiPens are used to treat people who are in what we call anaphylactic shock and that's when you have a really serious allergic reaction. And one of the worst things that can happen when you have a bad allergy is that your airway can actually close off. And what that means is that the bronchioles that bring air into the lungs start to swell and they actually close off the passageway for air. Epinephrine causes the opposite process. It causes the bronchi to dilate that would allow for increased respiration. So because the epinephrine in an EpiPen does the opposite of anaphylactic shock, it's used to counteract that process. Let's talk next about the adrenal cortex and what hormones it uses to mediate a longer term stress response. Well, there's a little bit more going on here. There are actually three hormones that are produced by the adrenal cortex, or rather there are three categories of hormones produced by the cortex. And they include hormones that we categorize as glucocorticoids, mineral corticoids, and gonadocorticoids. Notice here that all three of these hormones end in corticoid, and this is what helps us remember that they come from the cortex. Unlike the adrenal medulla, the adrenal cortex is stimulated by other hormones. And anytime we have a hormone that stimulates an endocrine gland, we call it a tropic hormone. So let's take these hormones each in turn. 
First of all, we have the glucocorticoids. Now, there are several different types, but one of the most common, and the one that we're going to talk about, is called cortisol. Cortisol is a steroid. That means that it's a fat-based hormone. It is not soluble in water. And the job of cortisol is to increase the blood sugars in your bloodstream. And the way that it does this is it helps stimulate the breakdown or the metabolism of fat and muscle so that it can be turned into glucose and released into the bloodstream. Now the availability of a lot of glucose in the blood is, as we've mentioned, really important to the stress response. Because if you're going to run for the bus, you're going to need a lot of energy. And that energy needs to be in a usable form. For our bodies, that's glucose. Cortisol also has a second effect on our bodies. It actually suppresses inflammation and it suppresses the immune response. Now, inflammation is one of the ways that our body defends itself against pathogens. Now, this doesn't make quite as much sense in our example of running for the bus, but what we can understand is that inflammation, which takes care of injury and infection, is a bit of a more maintenance type function. It's not as crucially important if you're running for your life. So if you survive whatever it is that has you stressed out, then your body might worry about injury and infection. But like we said, there's not enough energy to go around and so these maintenance functions are not going to be performed during a stress response. This secondary effect is why you might have also heard of the hormone cortisol. Cortisol is one of the hormones that can be found in what we call corticosteroids. Of course, steroids, again, being related to the fact that they are fat-based hormones and they don't dissolve in water. Corticosteroids are medications that are prescribed to treat things like asthma, arthritis, or other autoimmune disorders. And what these three conditions have in common is that they are overactivity of the immune system. In particular, they can cause inflammation. So in the case of asthma, the bronchioles of the lungs are inflamed. In the case of arthritis, it's the joints. And other autoimmune disorders could be the result of inflammation in other parts of the body. So the stress hormone is used in a medication to decrease inflammation and to repress the immune response. So here's a pathway that might involve a hormone glutocorticoid. Again, stress response begins with the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus in this case is not going to stimulate the adrenal gland with a nerve impulse. Instead, it's going to produce one of those tropic hormones called a releasing hormone. The releasing hormone actually acts on the anterior pituitary, and the anterior pituitary produces a second tropic hormone. This one is called adrenocorticotropic hormone. Now this big long word might start making sense. So first of all, it's a tropic hormone, which means that it stimulates an endocrine gland. Which endocrine gland does it stimulate? Well, that's going to be the adrenal gland. And what hormone is produced by the adrenal gland? Well, it's one of our cortico hormones. So adrenocorticotropic hormone stimulates the adrenal cortex. The cortex produces the hormone cortisol. And cortisol is going to stimulate the liver and again, cause it to break down fats and muscle to turn them into glucose. The second category of hormones produced by the adrenal cortex are called mineral corticoids. And the example we're going to talk about is another steroid hormone called aldosterone. Now, aldosterone is actually going to affect the kidneys. And what it does is that it causes the kidneys to reabsorb sodium. Now, sodium is not what we're after in this stress response. What we're actually trying to do is increase water reabsorption. Increased water in our bloodstream will actually increase our blood pressure and our overall cardiac output. Again, more blood going to our cells means that there's more availability of sugars and oxygen. But why sodium? Well, there's two ways that the kidneys can absorb water. They either absorb water directly or they reabsorb sodium 
and water follows along its concentration gradient. So pumping sodium back into the kidneys gives them a higher solute concentration and, and therefore a lower water concentration. And water will move from an area of low concentration to high concentration. Therefore, reabsorbing sodium also reabsorbs water. The final category of hormones produced by the adrenal cortex are called gonadocorticoids. And what do they stimulate? Well, again, the name gives it away. They actually stimulate the gonads. Now, the gonads are the ovaries and the testes, depending on if we're looking in a male or a female. And the gonads are also endocrine glands. They produce sex hormones, either estrogen, progesterone, or in the case of males, testosterone. So the gonadocorticoids are also tropic hormones. Now, why do you need estrogen or testosterone when you're stressed out? The answer isn't quite clear. Science just doesn't know yet. So if you want to find out, you're going to have to join a medical lab, do some research, and please email me your findings. And so with a little bit of mystery, we can wrap up the endocrine's stress response. Let's go over what we've talked about so far. So the adrenal gland is actually divided up into two sections, the adrenal medulla and the adrenal cortex. And because they produce different hormones, they kind of count as different endocrine glands. And together, the adrenal medulla and the adrenal cortex are responsible for a longer stress response than what the nervous system can provide. Because if you're going to run for the bus, you need energy for more than just a few milliseconds. And prolonged response is something that the endocrine system does a lot better. In particular, the adrenal gland is going to provide more sugar into the blood by causing the liver to convert glycogen into glucose. And then it's going to increase the amount of oxygen in the blood by increasing respiration. And finally, now that we have energy and oxygen, it's going to increase cardiac output so that that oxygen and energy actually gets to the cells where it's needed. And it does that through increased blood pressure and increased heart rate. So the next time you run for the bus, you'll know which hormones you have to thank for getting there. We'll see you guys next time.